Za drizes buzdari skozdao. Welcome to Sir Hunt's Reviews. My name is Mark, and in this video, we're going to be breaking down the two trailers that House of the Dragon has just released. Please, before I jump into any of that, do me a massive favor. One thing, that's all I'm asking you to do. Please subscribe to me here on YouTube. That's the number one best thing you could ever do for anybody that you're a fan of, myself included. Also, if you're feeling so inclined after you watch this video, pretty sure it's going to be over an hour. But if you like it, slap a like on it. Like goal is going to be 420. <laughs> Get it? Okay, so these two trailers are set up in the sense that, like, uh, okay, the Greens version focuses on Alicent. Just look at her. She's like, I've done nothing my whole life but serve this kingdom. And then at the very end, when it all mattered, you usurp the throne from your best friend. One thing I noticed is I think that's Sir Arik Carjo behind her. Dude's got long hair. That's my buddy. He follows me on Instagram. You can see him right there i believe that's him i'm not sure it's really blurry but he's like the only king's guard aside from his brother uh elliot who plays Ar eric it's eric and Arik, right the brothers cargill we got them uh scenes coming up they both have a scene on screen right uh but if i had to guess alicent is going to continue that theme of like i'm totally innocent all i've done is nothing but serve and at the very end uh viserys wanted his son to sit the throne because he knew that no one would ever set the queen and then you get this guy this is the guy that she put on as opposed to her best friend who she knew is totally confident right totally competent right um Alicent, you're kind of the source of all of this chaos and turmoil that's going to begin happening in Season 2. But anyway, the next image <laughs> uh, that I want to discuss that happens in the trailer for the Greens is Aegon himself sitting the Iron Throne. And, and the scene is actually announced by Chris and Cole. He's yelling out, uh, Bend the knee for the one true king, Aegon. Cole sounds nothing like that, but I just imagine every British person that's a knight has like a grizzled, gruntled, veteran sounding voice uh but <laughs> just look at the way he carries himself like i'm not playing a clip in uh this video obviously but if you look at the way he just walks into the throne room whips his cape backwards sits on the iron throne has horrible posture his whole demeanor is like i don't care right that's his whole thing as a king right is it I don't care. Now, obviously, this is a TV show, so they've kind of dialed everything up to a 10, but in Fire and Blood, the source material for this show, and then also when King Aegon is mentioned in the many POVs throughout all of the A Song of Ice and Fire novels, one of the things that sticks out is that technically, right, and most of the historical sources agree on this, technically, when Aegon is proposed the idea of him sitting the Iron Throne and him taking the crown from his sister, he opposes it. Initially, at first, he's like, nah, I'm not going to do that. It's my sister's crown. What are you talking about? Mama, you're crazy. Right? And then eventually, he's convinced to take the crown because Alicent, Cole, and also Sir Otto all tell him that, yo, if Rhaenyra comes into power, you guys are all legitimate threats to her throne. You are legit heirs, right? And Rhaenyra's sons, everyone knows this, Rhaenyra's sons are illegitimate. Their father is Harwin Strong. Harwin Strong's not a Targaryen. Their father should have been Laenor, but we all know that that's not how that went down. So once Alicent convinces Aegon and Aemond that his life is in danger, that's what makes him sit the Iron Throne. And because of that, he's like one of, he's not one of the, well, he's kind of a really horrible king, but there's so many terrible kings in Westeros. It's honestly not fair to label this guy as one of the worst because there are way worser ones. For instance, the third king of Westeros, Magor. His nickname was Magor the Cruel. This guy, uh, Aegon II, pales in comparison to somebody like Magor. But anyway, continuing on. Um, the next... Uh, s sorry, sc I'm trying to work out this new software. Uh, the next image is of Aemond, our boy. Now, one thing that I mentioned um, in a bunch of... Oh, yeah, speaking of which, if you haven't seen my last trailer breakdown, please go watch it and then come back and watch this one. It's p the pinned video on my channel trailer. Um, but actually, this one will probably be replacing that. So just go watch my House of the Dragon Season 2 trailer 1 breakdown. It's an hour long, and I will reference a bunch of the stuff that I talk about in that video because I don't want to just continue to repeat myself. But the next image that we had in the Green's trailer was Kristen Cole, right? Kristen Cole, and more importantly, Eamon. The conversation that the two of them are having will be really interesting. This is clearly before the events of Rook's Rest because post-Rook's Rest... Uh, I would assume that they would be a little bit, like, battle-weary, 
Uh, it's possible that this could be post Rook's rest, and this could be when uh, Aemond is declared Prince Protector, Regent of the Realm. Like, he basically assumes the role of King Aemond in everything but name. He never takes the name King Aemond, and that's out of respect for his brother. Aegon, King Aegon, is still alive, but Aemond is his heir. He's the one who's running the Seven Kingdoms. Uh, but initially, when this season will start... The roles on the green side are as such. You have King Aegon, you have his wife, Queen Helena, then you have the Queen Regent, right? His mother, who is obviously Alicent, and then his father, uh, or sorry, his grandfather, Alicent's father, is Sir Otto. He is uh, King Aegon's hand to the king as of right now, but eventually, uh, probably within one or two episodes, Kristen Cole becomes the hand of the king to King Aegon. Basically, Aegon gets bored with Otto's planning and lack of doing stuff, so he names Kristen Cole his hand. Uh, one of the interesting things about the dynamic between Kristen Cole and Aemond is that they respect each other, right? And all the way up until the very end, um, and they have a disagreement. Basically, Aemon wants to stay in the Riverlands with his dragon, Vagar, and uh, Kristen Cole proposed the idea to wait for Aegon and Sunfire to join them, and maybe someone can go inside the city and, and sneak out Helena, and then Helena and Dreamfire can join them. But the two of them uh, disagree, and my whole point in saying all that is, like, Aemon could easily tell Cole, like, no, take all your forces, you're going to stay here with me. But instead of doing that, he respects him so much, he allows him to make his own decision and to be, uh, you know, like, the one to lead the forces a certain way, and Aemon will stay in the Riverlands waiting for his Uncle Damon. So their relationship is going to be expanded upon. We got a little bit of it in Season 1 when they're walking through the streets of King's Landing and they have to go and visit with the whores, asking for information about where Aegon could potentially be. And what's really cool is that once Rook's rest happens, a uh, Kristen Cole is actually wearing the Hand of the King chain, uh, that's something that, in canon, Tyrion makes it when he's handed the king in A Clash of the Kings, which is book two in A Song of Ice and Fire, when he, his father, Tywin, sent him to go and rule in his stead because Tywin is in the Riverlands fighting a war with Robb Stark. Tyrion goes and becomes a hand of the king and starts setting a bunch of rights that were wrongs, and uh, he ends up having a chain fashioned out of hands that are interlocking uh, one to the other. The TV show, they kind of did their own thing, and they made it just a, some sort of, like, historical thing, right? Um, the, the next image that we want to discuss is Vega. Now, this uh, this scene is actually repeated. So this is four seconds into the trailer. This scene is repeated in the Blacks trailer. Uh, it's, you know, and I know this is going to insult a few people, but it's kind of interesting that the greens are featured almost as much as the blacks are in their own trailer. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Obviously, I'm team small folk. I'm team blacks, and I'm team greens. I'm team Martin. I'm team Westeros. I'm team A Song of Ice and Fire. I'm team Tell Me a Good Story, and I'm going to root for whoever I want to because I'm a free-willed individual, and I'm not going to be forced and confined into who you think is right and who you think is wrong. I'm going to root for my favorite, period, right? Whoever I think is the most well-rounded, dynamic characters. But anyway... The Greens, Vega in particular, and Aemon, and this is the battle at Rook's Rest, the whole trailer, both trailers feature Rook's Rest stuff heavily, there's a lot of exciting events that are happening, but like I mentioned um, when I first pulled this slide up, this is actually uh, a, a an extended clip, it's about three or four seconds in the middle of the Blacks trailer, when Rhaenyra's talking to Rhaenys, and it's Rhaenys' death speech. But just continuing on here, the next image that pops up is Cole, with his hand to the king, riding into battle. And remember, I just told you, this whole trailer's featuring on Rook's Rest. This is that m massive charge uh, at the beginning of Rook's Rest that will lead uh, where, where Cole... This is already after Aegon has made him handy the king, but this is where Cole will lead this massive charge into the Black's forces, and they ultimately decimate them, because this is what calls for Lord Staunton, from Rook's Rest, to call for help from Rhaenyra, and Rhaenys is the one who shows up. What's interesting is it looks like they're breaking cannon and having another individual at that battle, but I'm going to talk about that when we get to that slide. Then the next one, this is uh, about... 15 seconds into the trailer um, mind you if it seems like there's a big jump in the gaps there was like a pre-teaser trailer that played for like the first five seconds and i clipped that and then also took the same 
thumbnails again, but continuing on here. This is, oh, little innocent Allison, when my lord husband was alive, I was the best person. I did nothing but serve the realm, right? Except for, you know darn well your son is not a more fit ruler than Rhaenyra. You know your son is a lackwit. You know that you did not raise him, right? You know you, you tried to discipline, but you disciplined him the wrong way. You know you made a massive doo-doo, and your cover story is that you're just an innocent person who was trying to protect the kingdom and do their best and do what's right by the lords of God and this by the seven gods and the, what's right by the people. Yeah, shut up, you high tower jerk. You high tower jerk. I love Allison. I love Olivia Cook. Let mind you. Let me uh, rephrase that. I love the actress who's playing this character that I love to hate. But in the first season, I felt a bunch of sympathy for until that last episode, right? And it's like this: these trailers aren't really making me me feel more sympathy for her. I always compared her to Cersei. Like a lot of people were like. Uh, you know, she's not like Cersei, she actually does love her children, and then the TV show kind of forced her into it by having Sir Otto make her go and see the king and, and consort him uh, when it was a, you know, a tumultuous time for him because his wife had just died. Now in canon, that's not how it goes down. Supposedly, Alicent and King Viserys were actually hooking up before Emma Aaron even died, right? So Alicent is significantly older in the books. She's got like 10 or 15 years on Rhaenyra, um, and... Uh, the idea that Viserys has a thing with Alicent actually makes more sense as to why he would willingly marry someone that young. It's like he already had a pre-existing relationship with her beforehand, before his wife died. But anyway, this little Miss Innocence, she didn't do nothing wrong, guys. Let me know down below in the comments how innocent you think Alicent is. Alicent, innocent, it rhymes. It must be the way, you know, Rook's Rest is the next <laughs> thumbnail. Um, it, 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 it's interesting. Uh, this is, I, I'm assuming it's Rook's Rest. Um, but that may be a different angle of the Dragon Dome because that kind of looks like the Red Keep off in the background there. Yeah, that's the Red Keep off in the background. So this is the Dragon Pit. So this is when, um, there's, uh, some more images later on in the trailer that I'm going to show up. There's some images where the dragon keepers are prepping a dragon that's actually Sunfire. And you know what? I'm going to bring that up right now because I just, like, teased it too hard. Because this is this is literally the first time we've ever seen Sunfire, uh, like, at all. Uh, close up or anything. Sorry, I have 85 images. I'm just trying to scan through them to pull it up for you. Uh, for you all watching this. Uh. Let's see, I've already started to go cross into the black thumbnail. Give me one second. I know that that's Sunfire. Where is it? Because it says the rightful King Aegon, and then right after that it shows Sunfire. And Oh, here it is, right here. Look at that! Sunfire! I'm as fearsome as any of them sunfire the magnificent it's magnificent it's golden uh, like okay let me explain the hype for this like obviously it's exciting that we get to see uh characters and we get to watch the familial dynamics explode and implode on screen and we're like ultimately safe and unaffected by any of it because we are viewing it right so it gets even more fun because like you can become emotionally involved in these characters but honestly there's no repercussions so you can kind of root for whoever you want and whatever you want to happen right it's fake it's fictional that being said these are real dragons they actually went to old valyria through a time portal and got real dragons so when these dragons appear on screen it's really exciting all right obviously i'm just kidding it's not a real dragon but we've never seen the pretty golden boy right and one of the reasons why sunfire's hyped up is because like if you're a greens fan you like the greens dragons right they're awesome right you got the biggest one vagar you got uh, obviously Dreamfire, who is Helena's dragon, who may be the mother of a lot of the other dragons, and she's described as being beautiful, like blue, right? And then you have Sunfire, the golden boy, who's like literally given the title of the prettiest dragon to ever have existed in all of Westeros because it looks like a sheet of golden metal, right? 
That's how this dragon is described. So, so then you're like, okay, that's visually pleasing as heck. It's, it's something that I want to see come to life on screen. But then you add in all these other things, right? Um, or not all these other things, two big things. The bond between Ryder and Dragon is the strongest of any of them, right? So after Rook's Rest, this dragon right here is messed up. This dragon is no longer as fearsome as, as any of them. Like, obviously, that's Aegon saying that, and Aegon saying it to, I'm assuming, someone who is involved with Blood and Cheese, and then we see in the Black trailer, uh, King Aegon swings a hammer. I'm going to talk about all that stuff here, but I'm just giving you guys, uh, you know, just a... In anyway, um, the bond between Aegon and Sunfire is amazing because Rook's Rest happens. Sunfire gets its r r wing nearly ripped off by Maelie's. Maelie's is massive. Maelie's is the Red Queen. It's like the third oldest dragon at this time. So it's one of the biggest ones, right? Definitely way bigger than Sunfire. Sunfire kind of holds its own for a little bit until Maelie's, like I said, nearly rips its wing off. And then when Vagar shows up, crashes into him, they all go hurtling to the ground. Sunfire survives the crash and has its wing nearly ripped off, remember, from Maylees, but then instead of, like, dying uh, because it can't, can't no longer fly, like, who wants a walking dragon, it stays on the battlefield and feasts on corpses, living on, uh, you know, dead bodies of soldiers and horses and all that stuff until it heals that broken wing, and then... After it had been left alone in the fields of Rook's Rest, Aegon, the rider of that dragon, King Aegon, is back in King's Landing, healing, half dead, right? He sleeps nine out of every ten hours, and he becomes addicted to the milk of the poppy, right? Dude uh, is not in great shape, right? So after this battle, Sunfire stays there on the field, feasting on the corpses until it heals up, and then flies to where Aegon is. Aegon is no longer in King's Landing. The dragon has such a strong connection with its rider that it flies to Dragonstone, where Aegon is currently hiding. Because once Rhaenyra takes King's Landing at the end of Season 2, I think, at least, at the end of Season 2, House of the Dragon, King King Aegon has to leave. Obviously, he'd be a prisoner, and she would execute him. So Lord Lari sneaks him out and takes him to Dragonstone, because Dragonstone would be the last place that Rhaenyra would look for him. Right? So, getting way back on track here, uh... This image, where were we? Uh, I forgot. I'm just going to pick a random one. Um, wait. Yeah, okay. So continuing with the Alicent lying and saying she didn't want nothing. Um, this is actually a screen grab that was from the last trailer too. She's talking to Lord Laurie's here. Uh, you can't. Well, no, you can't. It's not blurred as much as it was. Uh, that's his hand right there. Remember, he's got the uh, club foot, so he walks with this cane right here. So Allison is explaining, like, I'm so innocent. Yeah, but you let a dude do <laughs> the feet. Yes, the feet. Okay, but yeah, um, the the realm was at peace, but then you caused the peace to be gone, right? And then the next uh, image, and this is. Just real quick, this is what the Red Keep looks like under the greens, right? You see all these uh, House Hightower banners. You see anybody that's loyal to them are mostly wearing the same colors as their banner. Uh, Rhaenyra takes the traditional Targaryen sigil. So you replace that green background with a black background, and you replace that golden sigil, right, of the you know, three-headed Targaryen dragon, you replace that with a red one, right? So it's a red three-headed dragon on a black field is the traditional uh, traditional Targaryen arms. And King Aegon, when he's in King's Landing, he takes a different sigil. He uses the Targaryen three-headed dragon, but makes it golden to symbolize his golden dragon sunfire and puts it on a green background because green is the color of House Hightower. Remember season one when Alicent wore that green dress and that meant that she declared war against the Targaryens, kind of like she's defying what her husband says, even though she knows that her husband's daughter, her former best friend, is being unfaithful to her husband, right? Um, or not unfaithful at the time, but basically just caused Kristen Cole to betray his vows, and she took that a certain way. It's like uh, the whole reason why HBO is showing you this is because, like, it, 
when the city flips over to Rhaenyra's power, it's going to look the complete opposite. You're going to see the traditional Targaryen arms. The ones that we saw waving over the ashes and the ruins of the Red Keep in Daenerys and House of the Dragons, or sorry, in Game of Thrones Season 8, Episode 6, right? That was that famous image. So they're just kind of showing you, like, the phases that... Um, the Red Keep goes through. Because remember, that was a theme in season one. It's like when when Rhaenyra went away to Dragonstone and then when she comes back uh, to King's Landing to have her children, she looks at uh, how different the Red Keep is, right? She's like, what, what is all this religious crap hanging up here? She's like, this is not how it looked when I was growing up here. And Allison makes a note of saying like, yeah, we kind of, uh, we sort of reformed it a little bit. We maybe were a little bit more conservative with the wall hangings, where the Faith of the Seven, where the high towers, were not some, you know, Targaryens with their, uh, you know, how they get down with doing hooking up with dragons and stuff. They had that depicted on the walls, and Alicent changed that. And this is showing you that her son's influence is, is, is taking over a little bit more in the Red Keep. And the next image I want to discuss, this one's pretty fun. Uh, this is Aegon's first small council. Uh, Cole is escorting Alicent in, and then from uh, the very next, like, clip that we're shown is of uh it's actually of Rhaenyra it's like a quick uh kind of juxtaposition where we saw Alicent entering the small council chamber right and they're talking about how King Aegon is the rightful heir and all this stuff but then they're also reminding you like oh no 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 that's not true the rightful heir is actually right here and she's uh the rightful ruler but they 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 say they try to make th their whole point being that oh the realm would never accept a queen and mind you that is the case that is actually the case that certain people literally side with the greens because they have a king as opposed to a queen ruling them so that is the case for certain parts of the realm but ultimately Every single person that came to bend the knee to Rhaenyra when Viserys made them do so in season one, they still would have probably bent the knee if Rhaenyra was the one to ascend the Iron Throne because the entire King's Landing, all of their forces, all of their dragons are sided with Rhaenyra. So anybody else that would have never accepted a queen would have been forced to do so because she has dragons, right? And her sons would eventually precede her and they are men right not women's so it's it's kind of crazy to me that allison is like sticking with it this much it's like oh it's awesome that's what makes this show so good um and then after that we get the king with his swaggered walk entering the room uh entering the throne room he kind of is nonchalant remember i was mentioning before his whole attitude is like Ah, whatever, I'm the king, I'm great, I will do whatever I want, and whoever tries to stop me or get in my way will suffer greatly, right? And you can see that in this man's look right here. You see that? Sir Otto bows his head as King Aegon walks past him, and he's like, oh crap, I probably shouldn't have smacked him up at the funeral at Driftmark in episode 7, season 1, House of the Dragon. I probably should have been nicer to him. This guy's going to end me. He's going to remove me from my power. Oh yeah, I forgot I can kind of do a Sir Otto accent. Uh, you, wait, how does the line go? It is now that you have the power to... It is now I see the, the crap... How does the line go? It's like now I see you have, now I see you have the determination to win it. I'll have to listen to it, right? I'll have to listen to Sir Auto talk, and in my next video, I promise I'm gonna bring you guys a Sir Auto impression. But just look at him, look at him. He's bowing. He's like, oh, uh, please excuse my previous behavior, sir. Um, please excuse what I did before. I didn't mean it. I promise. Please forgive me. Please don't hurt me. You have a dragon. You are not my little grandson anymore that I can smack, smack, smack around. That's not the case. Uh, please. <laughs> that's what. That's all the stuff that I was getting from that. And then he just kind of swaggers up to the throne, whips his cape back, and plops his booty on that throne room. Uh, now, what's interesting is the, the promo teasers that they released uh, just yesterday. Um, they showed the Iron Throne piercing through his cape. Now, in canon, King Aegon... It's not actually mentioned if he's cut by the Iron Throne, 
But you know who is? Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra is cut by the Iron Throne as soon as she sits on it. She's uh, forced to listen to certain things, and she ends up gripping and grabbing the Iron Throne so hard that her hand gets cut. And her first time sitting it, she walks away and blood drips down. So, like, yeah, this is interesting. I love this imagery. I love the nonchalant, I don't care, but don't, don't pee me off kind of king, you know? Like, that. that's, that's what you want to see the most. Like, uh... Sorry, those characters are the ones you want to see get their comeuppance the most. It's like, he's acting like a little turd. Eventually, he's going to get his comeuppance. But let's just let him be a little turd. Let him cook, right? Let's let him cook so that he can be a super turd sandwich when he finally gets his comeuppance. That's what I'm, like, looking forward to. And I admire the actor. Tom Glenn Carney's an amazing actor. I've never seen him in anything outside of this. But he killed this role in the episodes that he's had so far. And then also the scenes that we're seeing from the trailer. The next image that pops up, this one's kind of interesting, it's crazy. Uh, we have Sir Arik. Uh, Arik, where where are you, buddy? He pops up right after that, there he is. Um, so we the scene is like men preparing for war in King's Landing. It's a battlement, right? Or, or sorry, they're on the battlements, and they've got this giant uh, scorpion or ballista, however you want to call it, giant crossbow that can destroy dragons. Uh, what's really weird is it looks like if we go back to this, uh, previous image, it looks like they are loading it up. And remember the last time we saw anyone on the battlements of King's Landing loading up scorpion bolts, it was because Daenerys was attacking the city and they had to defend the Red Keep, or at least they had to try to, to defend the Red Keep. These are very clearly Hightower soldiers, right? This is, um... Quite possibly a different uh, part. Like, it. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. This could be a different uh, scene, but it's, 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 that's the same ballista, and we can see the red keep, part of the red keep right here, right? Like, that's the red keep. Those are 100% the battlements. Uh, the crenellations and towers that go along with the Red Keep. So something happens where individuals think that war is coming. Now, at the point where Rhaenyra takes King's Landing, Eric and Arik are already dead, right? So what happens in canon is blood and cheese. So, okay, jump it, going back even further. Lucerus is killed. Damon, uh, in canon is at Hall and he sends a letter to Rhaenyra, and he says, an eye for an eye, son for a son. Uh, he then hires, through Mysaria, the white worm, crazy accent lady, right? He hires two individuals. Blood, who's a former gold cloak that used to work with Damon, but he got removed from the gold cloaks for being just, a, in short, a terrible person. And then also Cheese. Cheese is a rat catcher who knows the secret tunnels that Magord had built underneath the Red Keep in order for him to escape if the city was being <coughs> laid siege to. So, Blood and Cheese go into the Red Keep, kill Jaehaerys, who is the king's son, as a response to this, King Aegon sends Arik under the guise of his brother Eric, who's Rainier's, uh, basically her king's guard. It's, it's the one person, he's her sole protector, right? He's her sworn shield. So he, King Aegon, sends Arik under the guise of Arik to Dragonstone. And his goal is to go into Dragonstone, go into Rainier's room, at pretending to be her protector, and then kill her and end the war right then and there, right? Well, when he does this, he sneaks into the Red Keep. Everything's going perfectly. No one thinks anything is up until his brother Eric is doing his job. He's at his uh, he's at his post, so to speak, right? So then Rhaenyra... Um, well, sorry, I didn't mean to say Rhaenyra. So then the two of them clash they immediately know why like eric immediately knows why Arik is there and they begin fighting in short the two of them die in each other's arms so now getting back on track here this cannot be the fall of king's landing where rainier takes king's landing because this guy eric eric um, luke Tittenzor, my buddy he follows me on instagram we talk frequently i talked to them a bunch through the off season uh smoking buds you know what i'm saying um uh, but, yeah, like, it, 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 this scene has to be something that's sort of added um, 
maybe there's a small chance that uh, it is the fall of King's Landing and Eric, for some reason, survives that duel or the duel takes place at a later date. This is interesting. Uh, I will say this, you all, down below in the comment section, let me know what you think is happening in this scene. Do you think this is the uh, fall of King's Landing? Or do you think this is just maybe in preparation for the riots? Like, the once the citizens of King's Landing see the head of Meili's in canon anyway, they see Meili's head, they're like, oh crap, dragons are coming, war's coming, we better flee the city. So there starts happening to be all these riots, and people start... Uh, destroying things, and Alicent has to lock the gates up. Uh, so this could be the soldiers of King's Landing maybe fighting back. I'm sorry, the, the soldiers of the Red Keep fighting back a riot that's potentially happening at the gates outside of the Red Keep. Uh, but you all let me know what you think is happening down below in the comment section. Then the next image that I want to discuss is Damon. Damon is in what appears to be the Veil, although I know it's not the Veil. I know it's Heron Hall, uh, mostly because... Now, this isn't that, this is not really that, uh, at, this, I guess, how would you put it? This is not like 100%, but you see the stones right there? Um, there is a, an image that we have of Heron Hall from, uh, Hot, from House of the Dragon season one. And in that image, uh, we could tell that it's burned, right? Like, obviously, we know that... Sorry about that. I'm trying to find an image. Like, we know that Heron Hall looks like this, right? This is what Heron Hall looks like. This is House of the Dragon, Game of Thrones, continuing that theme. It's like Heron Hall was this massive castle. It was the largest castle um, in, in really all of Westeros. Uh, there are places like Castle Rock that's potentially bigger. Um, but the... The backstory for Heron Hall is that Heron Hall is this castle that was built in the Riverlands, and the Riverlands is the area where Catelyn Tully is from. So you remember in Game of Thrones, where when her father dies and her brother Edmure the idiot is trying to shoot arrows to light her father's uh, boat on fire, but he keeps missing, and then her uncle the Blackfish steps up and shoots an arrow and then catches her father Hoster Tully's boat on fire to burn him down into the river, and like that's the way that. Uh, House Tully buries their dead, right? So, House Tully is the ruler of the Riverlands, and in the Riverlands, it's this 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 area of the map that is extremely um, vital to controlling a massive, important, you know, rich region of Westeros that has a lot of resources, right? So, in the Riverlands, there's always some king, a river king, that's fighting another river king for dominance, until the Targaryen showed up. Once Aegon shows up and makes everyone bend the knee, he's like, yo, I'm gonna make Hoster Tully the leader of the Riverlands. He bent the knee, or sorry, not Hoster Tully, Hoster Tully's Catelyn's father. He he says, I'm gonna make, it's the ruler of House Tully in the Riverlands at that time. He says, I'm gonna make House Tully the rulers of the Riverlands. They're gonna be Bannermen to me. They bent the knee, right? But before he does that, uh, he he does something called the burning of Heron Hall, right? Where basically there's this guy who's in Heron Hall. Oh yeah, mind you, in the Riverlands, Heron Hall is this castle that this dude named Heron the Black uh takes 40 years to build. He basically steals stones and steals supplies and gold and everything he needs to build this castle from the surrounding keeps and areas in the Riverlands. So when Aegon comes over and Heron the Black is in his castle, this massive stone keep, uh, he refuses to bend the knee and he's like, I've got everything I need right here in this castle. So Aegon's like, all right, bet. So then Aegon ends up roasting this dude, Heron the Black, alive in the Riverlands and installs House Tully as the leader of the Riverlands. So... Heron Hall is this massive burned castle that Beleriand the Black Dread and Aegon the Conqueror burned down, right, uh, to the point where it's a ruin um, to, compared to what it formerly was, right? But it's still a formidable fortress, and it ends up becoming a massive rallying point for Rhaenyra's forces when Daemon takes the castle. So, getting back on track here, we see Daemon... And potentially what looks like it could be, like I said before, it looks like the Vale. looks like where they film a lot of the Vale scenes, but this is the Riverlands. That's probably like a massive 
it's supposed to be like a gorge where a river was, but this is all of Rhaenyra's forces in the Riverlands. And like I mentioned, the, the house, uh, Heron Hall becomes a massive rallying point. So going back to, I think, Damon being at the forces with Heron Hall, those stones right there, those little pieces of slate that are piled in the corner, those reminded me of Heron Hall. Uh, but you all let me know what you think down below in the comment section. Do you think I'm wrong? This is very clearly Damon looking at all of Rainier's forces. Every single tint is black, and then the ones in the background are red. Those colors are synonymous with Rainier's forces, the blacks. The greens use green tints, as we've seen throughout the couple of trailers they've released whenever they show the greens forces for the Rook's Rest battle. And then the next image, we have... Sir Otto. Sorry, I gotta catch my breath. This is a 35-minute rant. This is no edits, no cuts. Uh, um, so yeah, go grab, pause it right here. Go grab a cigarette or whatever you got to do. Go to go, go pee pee or whatever. Um, look at Sir Otto. He's sitting on the pooper, taking a pooping. See, and Alicent is like, "Oh, come on, Dad. Do you really have to do this? You're farting in here, and even the window's open. I can still smell it." Look, she's fanning. She just got done fanning the fart away from her noise, away from her noise, away from her nose. <laughs> Hey, that's a nice nose you got there. Nice nose. Noise. Noise. Nice nose. All right. But yeah, anyway, this image, we have the greens just continuing. They're, it almost is like they're trying to convince their, themselves of their lie, right? We get the two of them talking, and Allison's like, but he wanted uh, Akon to sit the Iron Throne. And Otto's like, yeah, that's why we're doing all of this. Because at the very end, Viserys changed his mind, right? And wanted his son Aegon to sit the Iron Throne. That's why we're doing all of this. We're doing the right thing. Even though he was planning on usurping the throne from Rhaenyra for years before. Even though he knew that his uh, animities or the animosity that he has with Daemon is going to bite him in the butt. And he's just trying to save his own hide. He's like, oh yeah, uh, you know, this is a rightful heir. We don't want the Seven Kingdoms to be thrown into war. So that's why we have this dude. Dude, this this king, right? Aegon, he's the true born son of the king. He married his sister. His kids are incestuous Targaryens. They're what you want, right? But instead, really, he's trying to save his own butt because Damon hates him. And he made it a point to have Damon hate him because he abused his power to put Damon in the position that he was to go down to the Stepstones and kind of pit King Viserys against King Damon, ultimately. So, yeah, it's coming back to bite you in the hiney, you dingbat, Sir Otto. Uh, <laughs> Then we have quick shot of Rainier. This is like my favorite shot of Emma Darcy. They are absolutely exquisite, stunningly beautiful as Rainier. They're going to do an amazing job portraying them. Like, I, it's uh, like obviously Millie Alcock did an amazing job, but I've always looked forward to em Emma Darcy's portrayal because they were the one who was cast to play Rainier for the majority of the show. Like, it was kind of a weird choice to have them played by a younger person and then a different act, uh, actor when the in the second half of season one. That was kind of weird, but I always knew that whatever they saw in Emma Darcy was what I wanted to see on screen. I wanted to see what the casting director saw when they were performing, when they were doing their uh, audition to play the role. It's like, Rainier is one of my favorite characters in all the Song of Ice and Fire, so whenever I heard who's going to be playing them I'm like dude they have to be amazing because that's one thing that HBO always does amazingly well is casting these characters in certain roles like Jon Snow would not be who he is if Kit Harington hadn't played him better yet Amelia freaking Clark Daenerys would not be who she was and as iconic as she was if Amelia Clark wasn't the person that was cast to play them. You can debate me down below in the comment section, but literally they saw that these actors who had previously little to no experience were going to be the embodiment of these roles. So that's always got me extremely hyped. I, th this image right here looks the most like Rhaenyra out of any of the images that I've seen so far. Uh, aside from obviously when Rainier wears the crown, and then there's obviously other images that gives more of the Rainier of uh, vibes in these in these these teasers, but it's just this this just stuck with me. It just it's, it's so pretty. She's like uh, contemplating, kind of thinking, like what's my next plan? She's like tucking tucking her nails, kind of it's like that that thing that Allison did in season one. Like oh, this is gonna be so awesome. Uh, whew. Then the next <laughs> the next image that I want to discuss is dragons, dragons, now this is very clearly Cyrax, and I don't want to say very clearly because of the color patterning, but then also you look at the tail, 
right? That tail, that's that spike ball tail that we know so infamously famous. Um, and then also Cyrax has horns that go alongside of her head, and you can see them very clearly right there. It's horn number one and then horn number two, and that's when you're riding. And just to uh, clarify, to show you what I'm seeing, rather, uh, Cyrax is, like, it's got an iconic silhouette, yes, but also, like, the the sil I'm sorry, it's got an iconic silhouette of the head, yes, but, uh, hang on, I'm just looking for a picture, Cyrax. It's got an iconic silhouette of its head, but also the tail. That's what I was looking for an image of. The tail. Wow, this is... Uh, okay. Um, so this is Cyrex. Let me know what you all think down below in the comment section. Uh, I, I think it's Cyrex because you could see... Wow, it's really not... Here we go. Here we go. And of course, the tail is cropped out of that image. Oh my... Okay, so that's fan art. Really? Sorry, hang on one second. Okay, just trust me that that's Cyrax. Here we go, finally. All right. Cool. Okay, so... Let's do this. Okay, Cyrax. You see that tail right there? The tail, it's like spiked. It's a double spiked, uh, kind of like a mace. Like a, It's got spikes on both sides. <laughs> it's pretty like distinctive towards that dragon. So that's what makes me think that this, that's who this is right here. Cyrax, right? You see the tail. Um, it's also possible that it could be another dragon. Uh, this is at about 43 seconds into the Greens trailer. So you all let me know what you think down below in the comment section. Go watch the Greens trailer. Go to 43 seconds. Let me know what you think. Then the next image that I want to discuss, and this one's kind of really cool. Uh, or I'm sorry, this one I didn't want to spend a lot of time on. The next one's really cool. This is just an image of Rook's Rest. Uh, the dragon um, flew right overhead like we saw Cyrax, and then the next scene was, the, uh, like an explosion at the battlefield of Rook's Rest, and soldiers are just kind of tumbling out of, out of the way. This is the interesting one. Sorry, there's 80-some images, and I just was trying to make sure I was on the right one. Um, so, this right here looks as though this is blood and cheese. This is the beginning to it. Now, this it's possible that this is Damon. This is cloaked Damon sneaking into the city, but why would he be waving a coin purse to a guard? Like, Damon is much more calculated. He knows that there are certain individuals that are loyal to him, like Sir Luther Largent, who's the leader of the Gold Cloaks, and then uh, he becomes, like, second in command when the uh, Greens take over the city. Sir Otto installs his son, Gwen as the ruler of the Gold Cloaks, but doesn't get rid of everybody. And one of the people he leaves is Luther Largent. And Luther Largent is the one who literally opens the city gates for Rhaenyra's men uh, because she, the Gold Cloaks are loyal to Damon. Damon found the Gold Cloaks. But this right here, this looks like this is actually cheese bribing, uh, you know, the guards to sort of let them pass, right? Uh, then... Like, the follow-up to that is the silhouette, I uh, know for a fact, of blood and cheese going into the tunnels. So, the individual from the previous image is wearing a cloak, and as you can see right here, you look at look at blood silhouette. We know both of these actors have actually been uh, announced. Uh, I'm trying to think of their names right now. It's not that important, right? But just know that uh, blood and cheese... The way that they sneak into the city is by bribing uh, their way in. And then eventually when they get to the tunnels under the Red Keep, Cheese is the one who leads them the rest of the way. Now, there was actually an audition, right? A leaked audition uh, that was uploaded online that said something that was basically along the lines of like, 
blood forces Cheese to take it the step further. Like, Cheese was only hired to lead blood to the Red Keep, and that was that. Blood kind of forces him into what they're supposed to do, which is kidnap the king's heir. Kidnap King Aegon's heir, Jaehaerys, and then they'll have a royal hostage to sort of end the war that way, right? But apparently, Cheese is not told this, and Blood is there to kidnap or kill. Uh, or sorry, Cheese is told. Cheese is told by Blood that they're just going to kidnap him. But when they do that, that's when Blood kills him. Like, obviously, that's not how it goes down in the books. Obviously, that could not be how it goes down in this TV show. We won't know until it airs. But it will be interesting nonetheless. And it will ultimately, the results will still be the same. Rhaenyra loses her son, and then King Aegon loses one of his sons. Uh, This is going to be probably one of the most gut-wrenching moments in the entire series because for the average show watcher, it's going to be near Red Wedding levels of unexpectedness if they edit uh, it how I think they are, which is kind of like alluding to the mystery of like, what are these dudes doing? They're doing something, but then ultimately uh, showing you that Like, you want to give the audience a false sense of security. So the way I would do it is I would show a bunch of guards surrounding all of the Red Keep, show that they're on patrol, show that... Uh, show that Helena and Alicent are extremely safe in the sense that they're just playing with, uh, you know, Jaehaerys and Maelor and Jahara, and their their guards are down, right? That's what I want to mostly be shown, and then you kind of see these dudes blood and cheese sneaking in the tunnel, or you see them bribing a guard at first, then you see them sneaking in the tunnel, and you don't find out what happened with them until the end of the episode, and then they pop up, and then do the blood and cheese scene right like that would be how i would film it but i don't know uh how they did for the tv show um it's going to be um, amazingly epic what's ironic is this guy Aegon, the whole time he's he's like anybody who plots against me i will play it back 100 times over and like they're showing you that uh his he's being plotted against damon is plotting against him damon's carrying out blood and cheese uh to go and kill his son to harry's so it's like yeah what are you gonna pay uh, them back for because you're saying this now you're giving this this big speech and then your son dies it's like what's going to be your reaction to that if it's not handled the correct way then you're going to lose the respect that some people may have for you right so after uh blood and cheese that's where Aegon rides out to do his battle with the brook's rest he fights uh rainies and Maylees. ultimately ends up getting taken out mostly um <clears throat> not taken out killed but taken out as in taken out of the picture he's no longer ruling from Westeros to the Seven Kingdoms, his brother Aemond is, and he's just put in the background and kind of healing. So the blood and cheese, is, I would imagine his arc is something like, he's like, I got to prove myself. But also, I'm not really afraid of my mother and my grandfather anymore because they're my subjects, right? So that's going to be his rule. It's going to be like, talk a lot of talk, and then blood and cheese happens, and then he's going to kind of shut down and turn into that broken little boy that we saw in episode nine of season one. And then... Uh, he's going to probably get some kind of a pep talk. Uh, he does get one. Allison tells him, you have no idea what we sacrificed to put you on the throne. And then that's when he's like going to f- fully on assume the role of like Chad, King Chad, King, I'm going to do whatever I want. And then, uh, yeah, like I said, it would be interesting to see uh, if he does say this, I will pay anybody who plots against me, pay them back 100 times over. It'll be interesting if the, he says that before Blood and Cheese and then what his reaction is post Blood and Cheese. Because literally, bro, they're plotting against you. Then the next image I want to discuss, and this is my favorite, my favorite image in all of the Greens trailer. Like, yes, I'm excited. We saw Sunfire, but look at this. This is Aegon the Conqueror's crown that has been built into a helm. A helm. Not just any helm, but the king's helm. His armor looks a lot like Damon's. And I'm also happy for that too. Like, yeah, it'd be cool to give him some Jamie Lannister, to give King Aegon some Jamie Lannister style of armor to match his dragon Sunfire the Golden. But that's not in canon. That's not in canon. In canon, right? That's my favorite. That's my rules. If you do anything that's in canon, I will be happy about it. I don't care what it is. I don't care how crazy it is. But canon is what made me love this series. Not so much whatever the showrunners and writers decide to make. That's awesome. But, like, this is one of those things that's not in canon that's just, I was totally unexpecting, and that's what makes me happy, right? But let me get, let me get back to the canon thing. Canon is that Targaryen armor is supposed to be dark black and steel. It's supposed to look like this. It's not supposed to be bright and colorful. It's mentioned specifically, like, in, I believe it is in Tyrion's POV, in A Clash of Kings, or maybe in A Storm of Swords, he meets 
with someone and he's in a room that showcases a bunch of Targaryen armor and he mentions how most of it is black plate steel, right? Not gilded steel, not golden colored crap, not enameled plate, none of that. No, they wear black steel. That's just, it looks the most uh, bad, but we'll say that. <laughs> I can't curse. Um, it's just exciting. I, I'm so excited. I was not expecting man's crown to be put into his helmet. Like, obviously, that's probably not Aegon the Conqueror's crown put on Aegon, King Aegon II's helmet, but it's probably the helmet is just designed in that fashion to look like the Conqueror's crown. I was not expecting them to include it in his helm and then to have him wearing that black steel. That's something that you have to to read the books to know because most people would assume that Targaryens have bright, bright golden crap and not all of them do that. Very rarely do they do that. Rhaegar's armor is described as black plate steel. Rhaenyra's armor is described as black plate steel literally when she puts it on to fly across Blackwater Bay and go and take King's Landing with Daemon. Daemon's armor is also black. This is dope. I love it. I'm so excited about this. Please let me know. If you would prefer, like, let me know down below in the comment section if you would prefer canon, like me, or if you would prefer they take liberties and maybe make his armor golden. Like, that would be cool to look at, but in my opinion, canon always beats, like, pleasing aesthetics. And then we have King Aegon in his armor. Looks a lot like Damon's, right? And that was right after he was given his helmet. Well, that's dope. And then I gotta, I'm, I know I'm not gonna spend that much time on it. Yeah, he looks cool. He looks sad. But this is the thing that we want. Sunfire, ah, fighter of the moon dancer, ah, ultimately you lose, but you still win, because you live long enough to eat Rhaenyra after someone slices her boob, um, yeah, Sunfire, look at him, look at him, that's the dragon pit, 100%, this is Sunfire, there's no doubt about it, they know that we... Didn't get to see Sunfire, and we complained in this episode 7 Driftmark episode how skinny and how, like, he didn't look anything like what we imagined, right? Like, they knew, and they're showing us him in the trailer. It's so awesome. I talked about this a little bit before, but this is right when Aegon leaves for battle. And he's saying, I'm as fearsome as any of them. Basically, respect my authority. Like, if you don't think I'm capable of doing terrible things then just know that I am. That's basically what he's saying here. And then the next image we have is of, I would assume, this is kind of what I mentioned before when I was talking about blood and cheese. This is what I would assume happened. So the king is like, yo, I'm the king. He goes out drinking. And when he goes out drinking with his companions, he shows back up. Remember, we saw that scene from the trailer where he just whips open the door and goes and sits the Iron Throne. This is this has to be something. He can't just randomly be breaking down in front of his mom because remember, he doesn't respect his mom in the sense that he doesn't think she even loves him. So now that she's his subject, he's probably going to get back at her for some of the torment that he's divvied out over the years. So if I would had to guess, I think this is post blood and cheese. This is after he lost his son Jaharius. And maybe there'll even be a scene with him and Jaharius where it's like Cersei was a horrible person. She has redeeming qualities in that she is a good mother sometimes, right? So with Aegon, he's got to have some redeeming qualities. One of those redeeming qualities in season one was that he was, it's not necessarily a redeeming quality, but it made you feel something for him is that he's being abused physically and emotionally by his mom and his grandpa and even his dad, Viserys, right? Like they're all, he doesn't really have one person that will love him unconditionally like every single person has conditions on their love it seems like in his life at least right so that was what kind of humanized him so then when you when you go into season two what more so because he's going to be even more unlikable right uh you got to humanize him some maybe he'll have scenes with jaharis maybe he'll he'll like be a bit of a loving father towards him even though in canon he wasn't necessarily uh, it would be interesting if they tried to humanize him more that way. And maybe that's what's happening in the scene. Uh, let me know what you all think down below in the comment section. This is just Allison from that same moment. She's like telling him, like, dude, you don't know what we did to have to put you on the throne. Well, you uh, are admitting that you intentionally manipulated to put this guy on the throne. Further admitting your guilt, Allison. Like you're saying, we had to put you on the throne. Well, apparently you didn't have to do nothing, right? 
You just waited until Viserys died, and then that's what Viserys wanted. So which one is it, Allison? Did you have to make sacrifices from plotting the whole time? Or was this kind of like you're trying to save your son's lives because Rhaenyra is going to kill them because they're direct threats to her rule? Please tell me, Rhaenyra, please. Please, because I'd like to know. Dang it. Uh, uh, I said Rhaenyra, please, Allison, to tell me because I'd like to know. And then we get a shot. <laughs> this is pretty interesting. Um, kind of crazy actually, but we know exactly what's going on because of that neck. I won't, I'm on this lick oh so heavily. Oh, no, I, wait, I'm on this, on this lick oh so heavily before, give me that becky. Give me that becky. Give me that, look at that necky. Look at that neck from Caraxes. I forgot that plot, so I can't believe I forgot that. Um, that's the Caraxes. There's no dragon that has that silhouette. This is Caraxes, and what's happening in this scene is Damon shows up at Harrenhal, and the individuals at Harrenhal are scared because Harrenhal technically would be loyal to the Greens because um, Laris, who's the head of House Harrenhal, right, is loyal to the Greens. So when Damon takes it, all those individuals in there, mainly the House Strong Garrison, Simon Strong, are put uh, in chains and locked up. And then... When Damon leaves Heron Hall and goes and takes King's Landing with Rainier, Aemon shows up here and kills those dudes that Damon saved. So it shows you that, like, this is the way uh, Damon does stuff. He's a professional battle commander. He's been tried and tested. He knows the best way to get the results that he wants. And then you have Aemon, this savage, anger, lashing out kind of teenage, like, decision-making level of skills. It's a nice juxtaposition. And we're not even halfway through these images, and this video is literally at 55 minutes. So let's pick it up a notch. Um, let's see. The next image I want to discuss is Damon. Uh, this is Damon. He's walking in the uh, area uh, that is dark, but it looks, the stone looks similar to Heron Hall. So I'm assuming Damon, uh, this is maybe where he runs into Alice Rivers or something, because it kind of looks like in the Blacks trailer, Damon pushes open a door after walking with his armor on in Heron Hall. He, this is when he takes the actual castle and he's like discovering uh, House Strong members and probably Alice Rivers. Uh, that's what he's pushing open the door. But this could be related to that. Um, this could also potentially be when he's at that camp and then he starts. Like I was sent leaks through the DMs over on Twitter. Speaking of which, please go follow me at Sir underscore Hunts or at Mr. Westeros, Mr. Period Westeros. Uh, but those leaks mentioned that. Uh, Alice and Damon will kind of have a thing and like a little tryst, and it's possible that this is what's going on here. Uh, like, you know, maybe Damon's not in camp, but he's he's at Heron Hall, and then him and Alice Rivers have like a uh, a love affair, not a love affair, but just like a hookup scene, kind of. Uh, in the audition that leaked online for the actress who's going to be playing Alice Rivers. It's kind of like that seems to be the way they were going because Alice Rivers is kind of taunting Damon. And uh, even though she's treating his wounds, she still is acting as though Damon doesn't, isn't very trustworthy of her. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, the chemistry um, seems like it's going to be pretty interesting. Uh, and the next image we get is one of Eamon. This is interesting because it's, show, it's setting up a dynamic or is setting up something that's going to happen Two seasons from now. So three or four years from now, this will happen. Uh, this is going to for sure happen in the final season. This is the biggest showdown of the entire series, if you ask me. It is the, the quintessential, most craziest showdown in all of the Dance of the Dragons. It was meant to be, right? Aemond and Vagar versus Damon and Caraxes. And that's dope because remember in episode 8... Of season one, they set it up because Aemon is bullying the two strong boys. And then when Damon steps up and checks him, he's like, bro, you don't want this. And then Aemon immediately walks away, right? So that was the beginning of it. Um, and then they'll kind of set up a rivalry even more this season. And one of them is this conversation that Aemon's having with Cole. He's like, my uncle is a challenge I welcome. This scene isn't necessarily from the dialogue that's playing over. This is just a scene where... Uh, uh, this may be, excuse me, that was an obnoxious burp. This may be where Eamon discovers blood and cheese. It's a possibility that he walks in on it. Uh, it's also a possibility that Eamon is having a secret fair with Helena, and this is him coming to get some booty, some late-night Targaryen booty. I know I would love to hook up with Fiasabon if I was given the chance, if we were related in a fictional universe and also had cool silver gold hair. Uh, in the next image, though... <laughs> 
<laughs> Next image that I want to discuss is all related to that. This is the actual conversation that those lines of dialogue uh, is from. Like, my uncle's a challenge. I welcome Cole and uh, Eamon. And this is before Rook's Rest. This is, uh, I'm sorry, this is after Rook's Rest. Well, no, it could still be before. This is after uh, Sir Otto Hightower has been removed his Hand of the King because you can very clearly see that Cole is wearing the Hand of the King. Now, it doesn't look like it's post-Rook's Rest because Cole's armor would be, like, battered and dented more and maybe, like, he would have scars, and, or not scars, but just, like, open wounds on his face and near him. So this is probably... In episode 3, maybe the beginning of episode 4, episode 4 of season 2 is where we know Rook's Rest is going to be happening. So this may be episode 3 right before they leave out for the battle, or it may be episode 4. Whatever, besides the point, they have this conversation beforehand, and it's going to come back um, towards the end of the season, towards the end of the series, rather, when Damon and Eamon have that massive face-off in the battle of Bubba God's Eye. But Cole and Eamon is a dynamic, like I mentioned Earlier in this video, it's a dynamic I'm really looking forward to. I can't wait to see uh, how, the the way they play it out. If they're going to be more of like like Eamon's just going to straight up respect him, or if in the novels, technically Alice Rivers is said to have used her love potions on both Eamon and Kristen Cole, and supposedly that's why the two of them agree to split up. So I remember where I said where Eamon stays in the Riverlands waiting for Damon, and Kristen Cole takes all of their forces back to try and go take King's Landing. Uh, when they do that, it may not be because Eamon respects Kristen Cole's decision and allows him to take their forces. It may be because Alice Rivers has set them against each other and they wanted to separate anyway, but they can't really kill each other because they're on the same side. So it'll be really interesting to see how that dynamic goes. Uh, this is just another shot from that same uh, you know, conversation. It's really cool to see these people uh, like... <laughs> On screen, I don't know how to explain it. It's just awesome. Like, Eamon, Ewan Mitchell, you killed it, bro. You're awesome. This is, uh, this next scene, this is a shot from Jaharis' funeral. So this is post-Blood and Cheese. And they're throwing, uh, those are just random citizens in King's Landing, but they're throwing down flowers or maybe some kind of a just mourning thing. It's like, maybe it's like rocks or something. It's, it's not meant to be anything but, like, mournful because they're throwing down those things and they're landing on... Allison, and they're landing on Jaharis' casket. Clearly, Allison is upset. Uh, it's interesting, though, because those same citizens are likely going to turn on, uh, you know, Rhaenyra when, I'm sorry, are going to turn on Allison, and then later on Rhaenyra when Rhaenyra's, uh, when Rhaenyra, one of Rhaenyra's, I think it's her master of coins, starts setting up all these different taxes to try to gain back the crown's wealth because initially, when uh, Aegon becomes king and Tyland is his hand, or sorry, Thailand is his master of coin. Thailand actually split it, sp splits up the wealth of the crown and sends half of the wealth to Casterly Rock and the other half to his, like, hidden. So Rainier has no money when she takes King's Landing, so she has to start taxing every little thing to get, to fill back up the coffers to, you know, have money to win the war, finish winning the war for the Iron Throne that she's, you know, currently fighting in. Um, like I said, this is at Jaharis' funeral. Uh, and then this right here, now this is interesting. This, they keep showing this, they keep showing this person uh, who's very clearly got the Bracken sigil, and then it looks like they are, like, betraying someone, because they suddenly pull a sword, and then it looks like the person who they're with is unex is not expecting it. So, in canon, Amos Bracken is actually the guy who defeats Samwell uh, Blackwood at uh, Storm's End. So, in the TV show, remember... The guy, Chad Blackwood, who kills the Bracken. It's actually uh, the opposite of that. The Bracken dude wins the duel, but he doesn't kill the Blackwood guy. He doesn't kill him until much later. Amos Bracken kills Samuel well, Bra Bra uh, Blackwood in the Riverlands in 130 AC in the Dance of Dragons. So in canon, it's like uh, the, the Brackens and the Blackwoods hate each other. They're, we don't know the source of their... Hatred, but just know that it goes back for so long and so far that it was initially something like the Brackens were kings and the Blackwoods were vassals of the Brackens being kings, but then ended up usurping their throne or something. So they, they, and you got to realize, I forgot to mention this, the the fact that they, it goes that far back that, that the Brackens were kings, it's like, that's before Aegon even came to Westeros because when Westeros, 
when Westeros was conquered by Aegon, Aegon took away all those little petty kings, right? So the Brackens were no longer kings. Any house that was a king, the high garden, uh, gardeners, right? All of them were no longer kings when Aegon came over. Hair in the Black, they're no longer river kings or whatever. He's the one true king. The rest of them are reduced to lords, right? So this feud between the Brackens and the Blackwoods goes all the way back to when the Brackens were kings and the Blackwoods did something to usurp them. But the feud is so crazy and causes so much turmoil and death that uh, there have been several times where Brackens and Blackwoods have actually married each other to try to get rid of the hatred, right? There's several Blackwoods that have married into the Brackens and several Brackens that have married into the Blackwood. So they actually share the same blood uh, at this point. Uh, the Blackwoods are a really proud house because they're one of the few ones south of the neck that still boast the blood of the first men, right? But, like, this whole thing that happens in the books uh, kind of makes more sense than it does on the TV show because they decided to go the way they did. They made Samwell kill the Bracken dude at that duel for Rhaenyra's favor uh, as opposed to just losing it to the Bracken. Not dying, but just losing the duel, and then eventually dying in another version of that same duel that happens later. So that's what happens in canon. It's like, these two dudes are fighting over Rhaenyra's love at first, and then when they fight again later, it's because they've chosen opposite sides. Like, uh, the Brackens have fought for the Greens, and the Blackwoods are fighting for Rhaenyra, and they end up, the Blackwoods, uh, Amos Bracken kills the Blackwoods in a duel, but then what ends up happening is after Samuel Blackwood is killed, his sister, Black Alley, and this could be the whole point of them even showing this scene in the trailer is to build up Black Alley's character because Black Alison ends up marrying uh, Cregan Stark, if I'm not mistaken, right? So you build up her character and you build up his character, and then when the two of them meet, you're like, oh, crap, cool. Wasn't expecting that. Um, but it looks like uh, this is where Amos Bracken kills Blackwood duel uh, dude and then immediately gets shot through the back with an arrow by Black Alley, who's his sister. So it'll be interesting to see uh, the way that they handle it on the show because they've kind of broken canon too much for me to really know the way they're going to play it out. Uh, obviously, you all let me know what you think down below in the comment section. Next image I wanted to discuss, and this one, I won't spend too much time on this. This one's kind of weird. It's just like, who is this flipping this coin? This is clearly happening. I'll just spit all over my computer and my mic. <laughs> let me wipe that up. Doop, doop. Um, this is clearly at the small council. This person is flipping their coin on their hands. Their hands look kind of like unused. They look like uh, Lord's hands. It could be Lari's. But the sigil that's on the coin is the Faith of the Seven. The, the Faith of the Seven. The Seven-Pointed Star. Um, so it's someone who is probably loyal to the Greens. I, well, obviously, everybody at that council is loyal to the Greens. Maybe Sir Otto. Maybe Aegon himself. I'm not really sure. You all let me know who you think is flipping the Seven-Pointed Star coin down below in the comments section. Uh, then the next image I want to discuss is another shot from that same council meeting. So maybe it was Aemond who was flipping the coin, although I doubt it. Um, but, like, basically they're letting everyone know. is like, no matter what your choices were, you have to realize that you're going to do whatever it takes uh, to get to the end game goal, which is to win the Iron Throne and end the war. So, so basically, probably, she's telling Aemon, like, dude, you killed that envoy, you killed Lucerys, and you set us down this path, and whatever we're gonna have to do to do it, it's gonna be awful, it's gonna be terrible, but we have to stick with it, because you chose to make that decision, you accepted it, so now, this is the path to victory, this is the only way to do it, I, I, I love this show so much, and I'm really good at breaking these down, if you all think I'm really good at breaking down these trailers, let me know down below in the comment section, we're an hour and seven minutes, and we're still going hard, we're not even halfway through these images yet, image number 40, <laughs> um, uh, all right, so this is Cole, and this looks as though it relates to the image from the initial uh, trailer that we were given uh, way back when. Uh, well, not way back when. It was December. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, it looks like this goes to where... Um, like, part of the same scene where Cole walks up and beheads Lord Staunton at Rook's Rest. Now, uh, we've actually met Lord Staunton um, in House of the Dragon Season 1, uh, Episode 10. He is this guy. Oh, crap. Whoops. Hang on one second. I'll save images. Okay. Browse. Downloads. He is this guy right here. This is the dude who Damon is walking up to behead 
in that scene that I was just showing. Uh, Lucerus is already dead. Don't worry about him. But this guy right here, supposedly, uh, he exchanges like insults with Chris and Cole. So when the Greens are victorious at Rook's Rest, obviously because Melee's dies, right? And there's actually a scene where Bela is on her dragon uh, moon dancer, and they are very clearly flying towards the crash scene of where Melee's lands at with her grandmother Rainey's, right? That's what I'm thinking is happening. I'll explain that later. But like this dude right here is the guy that uh, Cole argues with, and then Cole later walks up to him to behead him. Uh, it's, it's, it should be funny. Like the, the, the lines that they, you know, the insults that they tell each other should be funny. Um, this could also be a rallying speech that Cole gives, um, with Eamon and, uh, Cole, I'm sorry, with Eamon and then Aegon, because basically in the speech, Eamon says, or God, I'm so excited. My brain, I need more coffee. Oh, that's what it is. Coffee, keyword for weed. <laughs> um, uh, basically, there's a speech from the first trailer where Cole yells out, your king is going to be fighting beside you. And then there was also leaked images that we uh, were given, I think it, it was last year, but I believe it was uh, in July, was it July of last year? But basically, you see this image right here? Um, this is Cole and Amond, and... There was a scene that was filmed right when these images were taken where Cole is giving a rallying speech and he says, the king is now fighting beside you. And then Aegon shows up on his dragon and swoops in and rallies the forces to lead this big charge in battle. That's probably what's going on in uh, this scene right here. Although it's possible that maybe that's not the case. You all let me know. Do you think this is where Cole beheads Lord Staunton or is this the speech that he gives to rally everyone to uh, like fight better basically telling you yo the kings join the battle the next image we have this is very clear what this is uh, remember alicent is giving that speech or was it cole it doesn't matter someone was telling them whatever path you accept it's going to be violent you have to choose the path to victory like you made this decision to go down this path it's going to be one of violence it's going to be one to victory but it's going to be really hard uh, gut-wrenching way to get there, right? You, you may not be the same person you were. You may not even be human by the time you get there, but that's the path to victory. Accept it, right? This is the death of Jaehaerys. Blood and cheese happens. Jaehaerys is the king's heir, and this is the robe that he's wearing when he dies. This is the handmaiden who's distraught and brings this to probably, I would assume, uh, Alicent or Aemond or just whoever wasn't actually there when it was happening when blood and cheese happens the next image is of the king smiling ironically because now i remember sir Otto is the one who's talking during the trailer and he tells aegon he's like you know this is the path to war and then a king aegon being the nonchalant dude that he is he goes to war then and he claps like does that little it reminds me of the clap that it reminds me of gonorrhea the clap no it reminds me of the clap that uh, Sir Otto gives to Helena when she's dancing with Jaceris. It's like, the, the, it's the funniest thing. He goes, yes, yes. Like he does that really hoity, hoity-toity clapping thing. And then Alistair starts laughing. It's hilarious. It's so cool. He basically does what a joking grandfather does. It kind of looks like Aegon has now used that for a totally different thing. And remember... Remember what I mentioned at the beginning of this video. The whole time he's giving this speech, is like he's thinking like, oh yeah, anybody who tries to uh, uh, betray me or usurp me or plot against me is going to suffer big time, right? And then obviously blood and cheese happens. That humbles him. And then he has to sort of man up and go and fight at Rook's Rest. It's going to be a crazy arc for his character this season. Then we get a shot of Vega. Vega. We're getting towards the end uh, uh of the first, the Greens trailer. It's crazy. We've been talking about a two-minute, it wasn't even a full two-minute teaser. It says two-minute, ten seconds, but they replay um, some of the clips from the first trailer, and then also there's, like, the weird thing that plays at the end. So it's not a full two minutes. So it's really, like, a minute, 35 seconds, and I've been talking about it for an hour, <laughs> and I'm not even done yet. We're not even done yet. <laughs> Please subscribe to me here on YouTube. Please slap a like on my video. I love making content. Um, all right. 
Uh, then, then we've talked about Vagar quite a bit, but this is at Rogue's Rest. This is likely right before Vagar crashes into uh, Melees and Rainies, but then also Aegon and Sunfire. So then the next image I want to discuss is the charge. Not too much time, but this is after Cole is given the speech. This is literally Cole charging into the battle at Rook's Rest. Uh, that's going to be probably one of the bloodiest, most insane, exciting battles we've ever seen for sure in House of the Dragon, but also maybe even for Game of Thrones. Like, hopefully, Rook's Rest is at the same level of battle as Battle of the Bastards. Because you got to realize, Battle of the Bastards has not happened in the Song of Ice and Fire books, and Rook's Rest has. So there's canon that... For, like, how intense this battle is, like, three dragons fighting at once, two of them on the same side, one of them on the other side. This was the first really big battle of the entire war for the Dance of Dragons that kind of sets the tone and the pace for the rest of them. This should be Battle of the Bastards level of cinematography, uh, award-winning filmmaking. Because, to be completely honest, there's no reason why they shouldn't do that. <laughs> uh, then the next image is my boy, Elliot Tittenzer and... Uh, Luke Tittenzer, and they're fighting each other in that faithful card duel duel. This is very clearly Rhaenyra's chambers on Dragonstone. His brother has snuck in under the guise of him, and he's trying to kill Rhaenyra where she sleeps. This is post-blood and cheese. This is what Aegon does as retaliation against Rhaenyra for having slaughtered his son and heir, but Rhaenyra did that because Aemon slaughtered her son and one of her heirs, so it's like... Who's right, who's wrong, you don't really know. You can debate until you're blue in the face. Um, then we got an image of Allison. There's very, there's at least like five or six images of Allison just looking somber. Remember this one? <laughs> I love Olivia Cook. She's such a good actress. Um, all right, so then we got, uh, this is really cool. This is one of the few shots, one of the very crud. Crap. Okay, so this is very clearly not uh, King's Landing, but that looks like Aegon. That looks like Aegon. So I, I was getting really excited because when I first watched the, the, this trailer, I've seen it like four times now, but when I was first watching it and I paused, freeze framing, that looks like Dayron. That looks like Dayron the Daring. And there were two big rumors that were put out by this uh, Twitter account i'm not even gonna say their name here but they literally were just tweeting nonsense and two of the big things that they kept saying that nobody believed they were disproved in this trailer they say dayron was cut from this season they said nettles was cut from this season right dayron being cut from this season doesn't even make sense because george r martin himself has said that dayron will be making an appearance in season two house of the dragon and then you go look on the house of the dragon warner media hbo website Dayron Targaryen is freaking listed as a son of Alicent and Viserys. So Dayron is the, the fourth member of the Greens who's the most innocent, right? He's like almost all the members of the Blacks. <laughs> Just kidding. But Dayron is the youngest. He's not in King's Landing when his father Viserys dies. He isn't really influenced by Alicent. He wasn't tortured or bullied by Aegon or like meant to look up to Aemon. He's kind of doing his own thing in this area known as the Reach. Um... In the Reach House High Tower, uh, their they their forces are gathering to fight against. Uh, so so in the Reach, you've got the Westerlands. Uh, oh, I'm 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 confusing my areas of Westeros. But basically, the High Towers have all of the members loyal to House High Towers fighting all of the members of houses that are loyal to Rhaenyra. So in the Westerlands, uh, mainly the Lannisters and the High Towers are teaming up to destroy anybody who opposes King Aegon, and they actually do a lot of the victory winning for the Greens. So there's this little boy, Daeron, he's the son of King Viserys and Queen Alicent, and he rides this dragon to Sarion, and Daeron actually gets the name of Daeron the Daring because he ends up saving his uncle uh, from, like, dying, who's the leader, Ormond. He's, like, the leader of the High Tower forces. And after that battle where Daemon comes flying in out of nowhere on his dragon to Sarion, he's dubbed Daeron the Daring by his uncle Ormond. And he's just a really uh, well-rounded, likable character that is completely innocent, unlike most of the Greens. So that's why a lot of people like him. I was really excited. I thought that was him, but now that I'm zooming in this much, like I said, 
I don't actually know because this kind of looks like this could potentially be Aegon. Like right there, that looks like that could be Aegon. And this could be one of the castles that they take on their way to Rook's Rest. And this could be Aegon and Aemon looking at all their forces. And of course, they're not going to march with their army because they're the rulers of the army. And they probably fly ahead on their dragons. They probably fly way ahead on the baggage train with their wagons. But I will say this, the other individual down here looks like that could be Aegon too. So maybe these are just Hightower Guardsmen that are watching their forces either leave, right? It looks like they're leaving because they're marching away. And that could be Dayron down there in the bottom. You all let me know what you think down below in the comment section. The next next image that I want to discuss is Allison showing her boobies. Hopefully she shows them. Olivia Cook, please DM me a picture of your boobies. I need them uh, for research purposes. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> uh, Allison fully sinks under the water. Looks like she's doing a lot of self-reflecting. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if they give her, or if they go the Cersei route, where it's like, even though Cersei, uh, is a terrible person, it's like, you hate Cersei at first, uh, and then you hate her even more, and then you hate her to the point where you don't think you could hate anybody else as much as you hate Cersei, and then she has a humanizing moment with her kids, and then she gets locked up in prison, someone smears poop on her, and she's forced to walk down the streets naked, and then someone smears more poop on her, then in the book she falls, scrapes her knee, and gets poop inside that cup, so she's probably gonna die from sepsis or whatever, because she's got a poopy cut that she's infecting her, right? So you kind of feel bad for her after all of that happens, but then you still go right back to hating her, because it's just so easy, right? So maybe they'll go that route with Allison, in a similar sense, we're like, I loved her at first, and then obviously, right now, I kind of hate her because of what she did with usurping Rhaenyra's throne, and then you'll kind of probably feel s sympathy for her again this season because her son, Aemon, did something that she didn't want to happen. Maybe she'll have a couple scenes where she's trying to uh, actively stop the war, but then ultimately, you'll hate her because she'll still try to play the innocent. Like, she'll still try to be like, oh, I'm so stressed out. I need to go do a cold plunge or I need to do a hot tub jacuzzi melt in the bath because I'm so stressed out over problems that you caused for yourself, dummy. All right. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's going to be really interesting. Uh, and then the next image is, uh, this is, this is where it gets kind of crazy, okay? Because this is the image that I was for sure was like, that's Bela. Um, sorry, wrong one. Uh, on Moon Dancer, the dragon that we see in the Blacks trailer has the same color patterning as this. Moon Dancer is said to be green. Um, Moon Dancer fights. Uh, Sunfire, so sun versus the moon. Um, this looks like the area uh, where Melee's crashes. So in canon, Bela stays out of the fight uh, for the majority of the war. Her dragon, Moon Dancer, is barely big enough for her to fly. And because of this, she spends most of her time flying in between Driftmark and Dragonstone. That's all Bela does until the end of the story when... Uh, Sunfire and Bela fight each other because when King Aegon takes Dragonstone, he thinks the castle's empty, doesn't realize Bela's there with her dragon, Moon Dancer. So when King Aegon and Sunfire fly up to, uh, you know, uh, take Dragonstone, Bela flies up on her dragon, Moon Dancer, and the two of them fight in the air. Moon Dancer is so much smaller than Sunfire. And the only reason why Moon Dancer even puts up a fight against Sunfire is because Sunfire is a survivor of Rook's Rest. Remember when it had its wing ripped off and could barely fly and had to lay on the ground in the ashes of the Rook's Rest battle, feasting on corpses and horses, right? Uh, it took that dragon a year to heal and then fly to Dragonstone, right? So it's on death's door when Moon Dancer is fighting it. So that's the only reason why Moon Dancer is able to best uh, Sunfire, but eventually. Sunfire, Moon Dancer, Aegon, and Bela go hurtling into the ground. Aegon breaks both of his legs upon landing because he jumps off his dragon right before his dragon hits the ground. Bela rides her dragon all the way to the ground and is just left in like a pile of broken bones. It is about to die, but then uh, someone saves her life and she makes it past the dance dragon. In Fire and Blood, I don't know what they're doing. Uh, with her, but it looks like she will see her grandmother Rainey's die, 
um, and then fly to the landing site. Maybe she wants to take place in the Rook's Rest battle because Rainey's is the one who's going to go fight in Rook's Rest, and Bela's like, oh, I want to go fight too, and, and Rainier probably forbids her to do it, but she does it anyway, uh, and she circles the crash site of where she lands. Now, if you're wondering what I'm even talking about with the crash site, well, let me show you. Uh, House of the Dragon Season 2 was filming. They filmed uh, some interesting moments, uh, but one of the most interesting... And this was kind of confirmed through, uh, I mean, like, the leakers that tell me stuff through the DMs on Twitter are also telling other people some stuff. So I always say, my source sent me this information through the DMs over on Twitter. It's like, whoever was leaking it did, right? So this right here is a crash site that there's going to be two separate ones. One of them will be where Sunfire the Golden and Aegon lands, and the other one is going to be where Rainey's lands with her dragon, uh, Maylees. And at that site where Maylees crash lands with Rainey's and Rainey's ultimately dies, that's what is happening right here. This is the same wooded area. Uh, the crash looks like it's either just took place right there where the smoke is coming up at or the camera hasn't zoomed in enough uh, or maybe the crash site's been edited out because they have been known to do that for trailers. But it's going to be gut-wrenching to watch. Uh, let me know what you all think is happening down below in the comment section. Um, and then the next image that I want to discuss, we're at image number 50 um, at an hour and 24 minutes. Uh, this is King Aegon. Not spending too much time on it, but this is like one of the, his first scenes of the season. I would have to imagine this is before Blood and Cheese. This is episode one. This is probably where he's calling a small council or calling a meeting uh, because maybe he's just received word of what happened with his brother. His brother killing Lucerus somehow equates to Aegon having a confidence boost. Like, he's got, he just looks like he's swaggering even more because of uh, his brother's successfulness. Like, in canon, and on the TV show most likely, in canon, Aegon is actually the only one who's happy at what Aemon did. Like, he's like, yes, brother, let's go drink. You did you did the right thing, right? Everybody else is pissed off at Aemon for what he did. And like, dude, you escalated this war to a point where there's no coming back. But Aegon is the only one that's happy for his brother's success. And I did air quotations there because it's not technically success. It's kind of interesting that the one person who is excited about uh, what Aemon did and how terrible it is is actually the one person who's affected the most by it. Because what Aemon does at <laughs> at Storm's End and killing Lucerus directly results in blood and cheese, which results in Jaehaerys uh, dying. And that's King Aegon's son. So he loses his heir for something that Aemon did that he praised Aemon for. And he's one of the only people that praised Aemon for doing that terrible thing. So this show is so good. The next image I want to discuss, um, this, I don't know who this is. Uh, it's a dragon, obviously. Um, it's at one minute thirty five seconds into the green trailer. I don't even know, dude. Uh, excuse me. Um, it's really pale. Uh, Vermax. Is it Vermax? I doubt it. Vermax is an on Dragonstone that looks like Dragonstone because of how uh, shaded it is. Maybe this is something with the dragon seeds claiming a dragon. So if that's not Vermax, it could either be uh, Sea Smoke or uh, Nettles' dragon, uh, Sheep Stealer. Although Sheep Stealer is said to be a brown dragon, this kind of looks light. This kind of looks like a beige color or maybe a gray color maybe it's sea smoke although why would a dragon tamer that's clearly a dragon tamer it's got that weird little shepherd stick why would a dragon tamer be trying to oh okay so maybe if it is sea smoke maybe lanor um i'm sorry lanor's old dragon is now ridden by adam uh, valarion maybe adam landed at dragonstone and there's a meeting that happens in the black trailer uh, that confirmed Nettles, freaking awesome. It's the first time we've seen Adam on screen. This one right here, right? So you got Jaceris right there, Bela right across from him. Then you got Hugh Hammer, 
right across from Bela. Then down at the very end, that's someone who I'm not sure, but then right across from them is Nettles. And Rhaenyra is missing Eric, uh, Eric Cargill as her, you know, protector. So this is after that. This is right before uh, King's Landing is taken. Jaceris is back from the north. Nettles has already claimed her dragon. Um, all of these people sitting at this table have already claimed a dragon. So Hugh Hammer claims Vermithor. Bela's riding Moondancer. Jaceris is riding Vermax. Rhaenyra is riding Cyrax. Uh, Nettles is riding Sheep Stealer. Um, oh, oh, so then the other one would be uh, Silver... Well, not Silver Dennis. Silver Dennis guy. <laughs> I am an idiot. Uh, it's off the white. So this is probably off the white at the very end of the table. Off the white ends up writing uh, Silverwing, who's Queen Alicent's uh, former dragon. No, not Olivia Cook Alicent, but the old king, the very first guy we saw in episode one of House of the Dragon season one. His dragon, his wife's dragon was called Silverwing. So these two dudes at the end of the table, uh, you've got uh, Hugh Hammer, who's sitting next to Bela. And then at the very end of the table, you have who I'm assuming is off the white or off the salt, they end up riding the old king and the old king's wife for a mount. So Hugh Hammer rides Vermithor. We saw Vermithor in episode 10 where Damon walks up singing him the song, holding the torch. Hugh Hammer rides that dragon and this other one, Silverwing, one we haven't seen yet, who could potentially be the dragon that I just showed. I'll go back to that here in a second. But off white rides that dragon. So maybe, potentially, maybe, uh, that's... Uh, who this dragon is? I can't find the picture. Oh no, that's Allison Boobies. Where is that darn dragon? Uh, maybe this is Silverwing. Although I doubt it. Silverwing would be way bigger. It's going to be one of the biggest ones on the show because of how old it is. Um, although it's possible. You let me know who you all think this dragon is down below in the comment section. Then the next image we have, now this one is gut-wrenching. This will be one of the first moments that we have most of the blacks in the same scene before the war begins. This is after Rhaenyra has flown across Shipbreaker Bay to discover the remains of her son, and this is Lucerus's funeral. If you look over here on the left side of the image, we can very clearly see Jaceris, Rhaenyra, and her younger son... Joffrey, and then Aegon the Third, who's a baby at that time. Um, or sorry, maybe that's Viserys too. Or Joffrey. No, it's got the brown hair, so that's got to be uh, Joffrey. Um, and then we see uh, over on the other side, we have Corlys, Rhaenys, and then Bela and, and Reyna. And remember, uh, Reyna was actually pledged to marry uh, Lucerys, so she's going to probably be one of the most distraught ones there she ends up uh, obviously not marrying him because he's dead <laughs> in the next image uh, is of Rhaenyra it's just a close-up of her face at the funeral she's like her firstborn child um, uh, oh no that was just a close from before this is Lucerys is like her, obviously it's her second born child, but she's the one, he's the one that uh, she basically told was going to be the most safe, right? So like she, I'm sorry, I'm looking at, the, at this from a parent's perspective. She's like, she told him he had nothing to worry about. She's like, my kin are Baratheon. Like Rainey's is half Baratheon. This is the shortest trip. Storm's in right down, Storm's End is right across the bay. Right, and you'll be back the quickest. Just remember, do not engage in any fighting, and everything will be fine. Those were her last words to him before he went off and died. And like, yes, Aemon was the one who did it. Vagar was the one who killed him, but ultimately, he died at her hands as well because she told him that it was safe. She allowed him to go do it. So of course, she's going to be terrible in a terrible headspace for this whole whole scene. It's going to be gut wrenching to watch. Um, and then the next image. Oh, did I skip one? Uh, no. This is... Wow, this is kind of confusing. So that's very clearly Hall, right? Um, the Melted Towers are a dead giveaway, but then something we've never seen before, really, is this right here. This is the God's Eye. That is the Isle... <sighs> this is an Isle that is near Hall. that is a uh, pretty significant place 
Um, I always get it confused with the quiet aisle, um, but it's not necessarily the same, although I think it is because the God's Eye is in the middle of the lake, and the quiet aisle is a place where the maesters, or sorry, the septons, <laughs> whatever. There's this location, right, called the Isle of Faces um, in canon where supposedly the pact uh, between the first men and the children of the forest was signed in order for them to stop fighting. So when that happened, uh, there was a massive agreement that the first men would stop warring against the children of the forest, and that agreement meant that the first men were allowed to live in peace, but they had, to, and the children of the forest were allowed to live in peace, but they had to sort of stay in their own lands and territories. So there's several significant things that happen at the uh, Isle of Faces. Uh, let me give you one for in relation to this story. So Damon and Amon are going to fight right above this, right? Right above this in the sky, right up there, right where you see that light. Right? And then when they fight, uh, Aemon is on Vagar, and Vagar is older and much slower. So Damon, knowing this, and he's much more of a uh, veteran battle commander, flies Caraxes really high up in the air. Caraxes is younger and more sleek and agile, so it's faster than Vagar. Although Vagar is much bigger in size, it can't move as quickly as Caraxes. So Damon knows this, takes Caraxes really high up in the air until he can no longer be seen, and of course... Aemon and Vagar follow him until he gets lost in a bank of clouds. Once this happened, Damon pops up because he's sent Caraxes into a nose bomb, a dive bomb, right? And when he does this, he undoes the chains. Sorry, let me backtrack. Aemon straps himself into a saddle using chains so that he can hold himself while he's on his dragon into place better. Damon intentionally does not fasten the chains so that he could stay on his saddle better. Then the two of them take off. Damon does the thing where he goes up and disappears. Aemon follows after him, isn't able to keep up as fast, loses tracks of him. Then out of nowhere, Caraxes nose bomb, dive bombs, and Damon, since he didn't do the chains on his saddle, is able to jump off of his dragon midair and take Dark Sister off of his hip and drive it down through Aemon's one good eye. The one good eye he still had, Dark Sister gets driven down through it, and then they go caravaning and careening into the lake, the God's Eye, right? Straight into the ground, boom, bottom of the ocean. Several years later, Aemon's corpse is recovered with Dark Sister still through its eye uh, when it's dredged from the bottom of the lake alongside Vagar's bones. But Damon, his corpse was never found. One of the things that may have happened is that his body washed up on that little island right there, the Quiet Isle, right? And he was allowed to live his last few moments, the last few days, few months, few years even, in peace with nettles, right? So, this is Hall. That dragon looks like Cyrax. It looks like it has the uh, Cyrax tail. Remember, we discussed that earlier. So, with that being said, there were some leaks that said that Rhaenyra goes to Hall right before she takes King's Landing. And the reason why she does this is because Daemon has amassed all of her forces from the Riverlands, like he does, but in canon, Rhaenyra doesn't do that. She's on Dragonstone and takes King's Landing from Dragonstone. So this is something that breaks canon, but it should be uh, interesting. I hope it doesn't break canon and is a stupid scene, because that's the worst. It's the worst when they break canon, and then the breaking of canon is stupid. Like, Masaria's accent. In canon, Masaria's accent is nowhere near as bad as it is in the TV show. And they broke canon for that, and they made it worse. <laughs> That's what I mean. Hopefully this scene of what clearly appears to be, and if you cor uh, 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 corrugate it with leaks that have come out, uh, go alongside those. It says Rainier goes to Hall when damon has got all of her forces there. She gives a really uh, impressive speech, and then they continue to march down to King's Landing. Everyone leaves Hall, and then her and Damon go and take... Uh, their dragons and, and take the city so supposedly uh that happens let me know what you all think if you like those leaks and rumors or if you like the idea of rainier having a heavier hand in battle i think she should i just like i said i just hope the scene isn't bad uh, since they broke canon to add it right uh then the next image is uh this has to be dragonstone yeah 
Looks like Rhaenyra on Dragonstone potentially talking with nettles. Uh, I can't tell if the woman she's talking to is black. I do see that she has black hair, but Nettles, like from the image that I showed you, and Cannon is a black woman. Uh, this could just be one of her chambermaids. Um, maybe they're adding a story where Nettles and Rhaenyra have a scene looking out at her dragon, Sheep Stealer, or something. Like maybe she's watching Sheep Stealer go and feast or hunt or something, and she wishes she could go with him, but she can't because she's got loyalties now or something. And maybe Rainier comes up to her. Although this could also be Rainey's. Uh, you know, now that I'm looking at it this zoomed in, that could 100% be Rainey's. And maybe Rainey's is talking with, uh, I mean, I would say Bela, but we know Bela's hair is not black. So whoever that is. You all let me know what you think is going on down below in the comment section. Then the next image I want to discuss, this is a close-up of Rainier. Um, it looks like it's from that same scene of where she's talking to that person on the balcony. You got to realize that Rainier, especially when it comes to sea smoke, is going to be extremely sensitive about it because that's her husband's dragon, her ex-husband's dragon, the one who she uh, sacrificed uh, her honor in order to give him a free life, like, basically, she staged Lanor's death to make it look like someone killed Lanor out of a rivalry so that she freed herself up to marry Damon. And uh, when someone takes another person's dragon, it means that the pretty much in canon, the dragon's previous rider is dead. Because the only way that a dragon can have another rider is when its previous one dies. So any dragon can be ridden by any number of individuals as long as the previous person who was riding that dragon dies. So when Rhaenyra sees Lanor, uh, when Rhaenyra sees Lanor's dragon Sea Smoke being mounted by Adam Valarion, she's gonna realize that that means that Lanor's dead in like the planning and the honor of herself that she sacrificed to give him a, a good life or to like allow him to go and live his own life was pointless it was worthless because guess what he's dead and now someone's taking his dragon but we'll see and then the next image that we have is of uh rainier when she lands on shipbreaker bay if you look very off uh sorry if you look off and to the right that is a drum tower that is synonymous with, synonymous with storm ends um we know that rainier is going to take a trip there because Two things. For one, it shows her doing that in the last teaser trailer. And then also, we've actually got leaked images of her filming a scene with her dragon, Cyrax. And she's on a beach. She looks distraught. Uh, there's a video clip that went along with the scene, but I'm not, I don't show that in my videos because it's, it's a video clip. It could be copyright uh, or copyright striked, rather. Um, but I'm going to show you scene that I'm referencing this is what that is so you've got Cyrax right here in blue foam and you've got Rhaenyra looking out at the ocean and it's storm uh storms end and the, the rumors that went along with this is that supposedly Rhaenyra finds a fisherman who found the remains of her son Lucerys Rhaenyra takes those remains of her son and her son's dragon Erex and breaks down uh with the fishermen, but then eventually takes them back to Dragonstone where she buries him and enters his ashes. Now, we saw that at the very beginning, the first clip from the Blacks trailer. We saw that happening. That's happening right here. Rainier is burning the remains of her son, and it's going to be really gut wrenching and heart wrenching to watch this scene on screen when she first discovers his remains. So, like this guy right there, uh, Damon supposedly goes with her, but this fisherman right here. Um, it looks like he's terrified of Cyrax's reaction. So, like, Rhaenyra lands, she's still on her dragon, and then she could see the remains of her son. Uh, maybe he sends word to her, and, like, she just goes straight there and then finds her son. And then, obviously, Cyrax is going to let out a scream of pain, just like it did when Rhaenyra was giving birth to Visenya, and it was a stillbirth, and she was just in so much pain. It's like her dragon is definitely connected to her. Uh, then the next image I want to discuss, uh, this is, and we kind of already discussed this, this is the infamous dragon seed meal. Now, I want to give myself some props because I didn't immediately fall for it. And some of the people that said this 
uh, actively make fun of me in the comment section, and they say that some of my ideas and predictions and even understandings of A Song of Ice and Fire are terrible, and that I suck at making, uh, you know, uh, guess guesses or whatever. Well, let me tell you to suck it because I was right. That is Rhaenyra in her crown, and no, she's not glamoured. No, it's not Alice Rivers. These people, these friggin' people online, they said that Rhaenyra's smile looks off. Rhaenyra doesn't smile. And I think I even caught myself thinking like that for a little bit, but then I'm like, no, it doesn't make sense. Alice Rivers would not glamour herself to look like Rhaenyra in order to tempt or taunt Damon. It's possible. Whatever. And you know what? I'm gonna backtrack. I don't... I don't, uh think that those people are stupid for thinking this anybody can think whatever you want just know that this is Rhaenyra that image that uh some people thought were photoshopped um is not that's not the actual case that's Rhaenyra she's in her crown this is on Dragonstone this is most likely before she flies to Harrenhal to go and take King's Landing in canon she doesn't do that but it looks like she'd be doing that for the tv show so like I mentioned before uh starting on the right you have Hugh Hammer he rides Vermithor Vermithor is the dragon that uh Damon was singing to and then in front of him that's Bela Bela rides Moondancer that's Damon's daughter then Rhaenyra and then starting on the left side you have Jaceris Jaceris rides Vermex that's Rhaenyra's son and heir and then right next to him you have who I'm 100% convinced uh as far as for right now anyway that is Nettles. Nettles rides sheep stealer. Nettles is a black woman who rides a dragon and uh, does not look like your typical Targaryen. Uh, but that just means that Targaryen features are not as dominant all the time. And Nettles is, in my opinion, that's what that means. Some people think that Nettles was an actual witch and ensorcelled the dragon. Rhaenyra is one of those people. She thinks that towards the end. She's like, Rhaenyra, Rhaenyra's like, uh, I don't know, Nettles is black. There's no way she could have gotten a dragon because she's black. Like, that's literally what she says. Um, <clears throat> there's people that actually think that, too, after reading Fire and Blood. I'm not one of those people. I just think she looks different. That was George's whole point. He's like, you don't have to always look 100% like a Targaryen to still be one. Kind of similar to what's going on with Jon Snow. Jon Snow doesn't have purple eyes and white hair. He's got freaking Stark eyes, which are they're, they're supposed to be pale. George is kind of dumb when he says it. Uh, <clears throat> in the first book... It says Jon Snow's eyes are as pale, so pale that they could be dark. Like, what? Pale eyes would not look dark. That doesn't even make sense. Pale eyes. My kids have pale eyes. They have their mom's eyes. They're, it's light blue. It's really, really light blue. So whatever. Um, that's what I took it as. What that scene means with nettles is that sometimes you don't always look like a Targaryen, but it's not necessarily features that equal blood, right? And then you have Damon uh, at that same meeting, and Rhaenyra's like, yo, we're going to war. We're fighting. And then Damon looks over at someone, uh, and he's kind of like, you hear that? Um, this looks like it could be, he could be doing that to Nettles, although it could be his own daughter, Bela. I'm not sure. Uh, we'll see. Let me know what you all think down below in the comment section. And we're running up on two two hours of this, this video. So uh, jump into the next screenshot. This one... This one's kind of weird. It looks like it was Eric or Art Cargill, and that looks like Dragonstone, and then you see a dragon kind of flying by, and maybe uh, someone stole one or something. I don't know what's going on. You all let me know what you think uh, down below in the comment section. But it could... The person who watches the dragon fly in the air definitely looks alarmed. Um, and then we have Dragon Keepers uh, readying Rhaenyra's dragon Cyrax for her to mount and fly off to war. Dope. These guys are dragon keepers, dragon tamers. I'm not sure what their lore is for the TV show because they're probably going to do something different. But in canon, uh, basically, Jaehaerys has an order that is formed uh, called the dragon keepers, dragon tamers. Their only goal and their only task is to uh, keep track of the dragons, uh, basically shepherd them like these guys are doing. But the big difference is, is in the books, they wear armor. They all have like this awesome, epic-looking armor, and in the uh, TV show, they made them have uh, cloths. They're wearing like hair shirts and stuff. It's more of a religious order, kind of. They're all Valyrian. They speak Valyrian to the dragons. Um, next image. I've talked about this a bunch, but this has now been confirmed to be uh, Jaceris and Cregan Stark marching towards the wall. Uh, I assumed that it would some happen similar to this, but 
basically like from this image right here, you can see that that's Cregan, that's Tom Taylor um, playing Cregan Stark, and then you have Jaceris, who's uh, you know played by Harry Collette. But they're walking the wall. We all kind of assume this would happen, right? So like it's not mentioned in canon, but Cregan Stark is a Stark, and obviously if someone wants help from the Starks, it's kind of like what are you gonna offer to them? kind of, in a sense, because that's how all of the houses are. So when Jaceris goes up and asks Cregan to be loyal to his father's words, uh, Cregan's immediate response is going to be, for what? What you have to offer me? I'm preparing for winter. So uh, in that conversation, Cregan likely tells Jaceris, I want to show you the threat that the North faces. There's a threat that the North faces, and it's called winter, right? So he probably has him fly to the wall. It very clearly looks like the wall. We've had leaked images of uh, them filming several scenes at what looked like a wall exterior shot like this right here. This is from the actual trailer. Like, we, we just saw that uh, from the actual trailer. Um, that's uh, this scene right here. Uh, uh, but, yeah, so it's going to be dope. Cregan, Stark, and Jaceris Valerian. Uh, there are rumors. I mentioned this a bunch, but... Um, there are rumors that the two of them will be having a uh, gay love tryst. We'll see. Uh, supposedly in canon, Jaceris ends up hooking up with Sarah Snow, who is uh, Cregan's sister, and then Cregan forces Jaceris to marry her, and then the two of them, uh, their union is known as the Pact of Ice and Fire, where basically uh, the son of... So is it is it his younger brother? I think it's his younger brother will marry Cregan's heir uh but that never comes to fruition because obviously Cregan shows up too late and Jaceris is dead at the, by the time Cregan shows up so the pact of ice and fire doesn't get fulfilled until many many years later between Rhaegar and Lyanna in the form of Jon Snow then we get a shot of Rhaenyra looking epic like I said I just love I love just regular images of Emma Darcy when they're playing the role because they, they're so stunning. Uh, then we get a shot. This is cool. It's the first time we've seen Freddie Fox uh, playing Gwen, except for a small, sh quick shot of him from the first teaser. But this is him in his full-out armor. This is at Rook's Rest. Uh, he ends up becoming the leader of the Gold Cloaks. And then in canon, he's killed by Luther Largent when... Uh, Rainier and Damon take the city. So he's supposed to be the comedic relief. So uh, him, Kristen Cole and Fabi, Kristen Cole and Gwen kind of have a relationship where Gwen kind of screws up and he's a slacker, and Kristen Cole kind of whips him into shape. Um, supposedly, Gwen uh, gets along with Aegon, and the two of them kind of bond uh, during the Rook's Rest battle. Then the next image is. Very clearly, Cyrax, you can see the tail and the silhouette of the horns, and it looks like this is when Rainier flies. Uh, to, could be to Shipbreaker Bay, but it could also be when she goes uh, to give a rallying speech to her troops that are fighting in uh, Rook's Rest. That was one of the other leaks, is that supposedly Rainier goes to Rook's Rest, and that's why Bela goes, but they're sort of taking a back seat, and they uh, just are there to rally the troops. Uh, then we get a shot of... Amond, which very appears to be the Red Keep. I've talked about Amond a bunch, so I'm going to move forward. Uh, then we get a shot of... Remember I was telling you all, all these shots of the Greens in the Black Trailer. Where you get a shot of Sir Otto. More importantly, that's Tylan Lannister behind him. Remember how I mentioned how Tylan moves half of the Crown's wealth to uh, Casterly Rock, and the other half gets dispersed uh, to the Iron Bank, I think. Um... This guy, because he does that, when Rainier takes King's Landing, he's capt He's held captive and tortured. They cut both of his eyes out, cut his fingers off. He ends up having to wear a hood because his face is so grotesque, nobody wants to look at him. Uh, it's terrible, crazy what happened to him. But after all that, he still stays loyal to Rainier's son, King Aegon III, and he becomes uh, his hand. Um, he's He becomes known as the Hooded Hand. Then the next image, just quickly moving along here, we've got Corliss. Uh, remember, he got wounded uh, in, I believe, I can't remember, it's such a random thing. They just saw him diving into the water, and he's greatly wounded, and he um, is near death until the last episode when he shows up and declares for Rhaenyra in the Black Council, remember? So he's still limping on that same 
uh, Crutch and Kane, and he will have a big battle this season. The actor, I think, actually hurt himself filming that battle, so it'll be pretty intense to see. Uh, and then he, you know, just a continuation of that scene. He says, "You must crush this beast at its head." Like he's annexed the gullet. This is probably when they're going to go and take King's Landing, and he's telling Rainier. By the way, let me pause for a second. Corliss is Rainier's hand. Corliss becomes Rainier's hand of the queen. I saw some people saying that Damon was her hand of the queen. I saw people saying that Jaceris was even her hand of the queen. Or that Rainey's was her hand of the queen. No, in canon, Corliss is Rainey, Rainier's hand of the queen. If they change it for the TV show, that may be the case. But uh, in canon, Corliss is her hand. Um, then the next image we have... Damon at Heron Hall. Remember, I mentioned at the very beginning of this video, he was kind of walking through Heron Hall and discovers people eating, uh, or at least it looks like he walks in. This is part of that same scene. He's walking in the rain, right? And then it looks like he discovers uh, some people feasting, um, but not yet. Uh, this is, let me go back to that. What is that scene that he whips open the door? Yeah, right here. He whips open the door, and it looks like there's people eating. But this is all related to that Heron Hall scene of him taking the castle. And then we get a shot of Helena uh, and Alicent at Jaehaerys' funeral. This is right before the people threw this flower stuff down on them, and we saw the really somber moment of it landing on Alicent, and she just kind of is unaffected by it. Then we get a shot of Damon in the Riverlands outside Heron Hall. It's that same shot that we had of Damon. He's looking at uh, the field. This is from that same scene, right? Um, and then just continuing on here. Uh, I think this is related to that scene where Bela with Moondancer and watching Rainies fall into the ground. And I'm going to be honest. The most reason why I'm sticking with that is because that was one of the leaks that were sent to me. But right after that, we do have Bela on the close-up of her dragon, Moondancer. And aside from his scary-looking teeth... This is going to be one of the prettier dragons. It looks baby-like. It doesn't even have its full-grown horns. And remember, I told you, in canon, it's barely even big enough for uh, Bela to fly at the start of the war. She can only fly it for short distances, and it can't really, you know, compete with the other dragons that are full-size or full-grown and ready for war. So, this is dope. I love this show so much. I'm really excited to see Bela on screen. We get a shot of Rainies. Uh, Rainies is going to die uh, in Rook's Rest, we know that. I've talked about her a bunch. You get a close-up of her. This is the... She gives a speech to Rhaenyra before uh, she goes off and dies. And this is part of that death speech. And then the last couple of images, we got Aegon ringing the bell. He does the... Or, or killing someone. It looks like he might be hitting someone in the head with a mallet, maybe. Um, as part of some torture. Maybe it's part of... He discovered uh, someone who had a hand in blood and cheese... Um, then we get a shot of Vagar. It's a very similar shot that we've gotten. It's the same instance. It's all from the same scene with Vagar. Um, and then we get the shot of Damon opening up the door, which I just discussed. And then we get this shot of Rhaenyra looking amazingly stunning. I love what Emma Darcy has done with this character. They are killing it. And then the last shot we get is of Caraxes yelling because war has come and war is here. And thank you for making it all the way through this video. I appreciate it so much. Please slap a like on this video. Like goal is going to be 420. Also, please subscribe to me here on YouTube. That's the only thing I'm asking you to do for this video. If you enjoyed it, obviously liking it helps. But just please subscribe to me here on YouTube. Uh, my name is Mark. Consider checking out my Patreon if you want some extra content. Alone not in Zaltrizas Buzdari. Iskos. Thank you for watching.